Hi, everyone. Welcome to Tech Tuesday. Uh, my name is Tom Levine, Cornerstone's Tech Guru. Uh, thanks for signing up. And today we're going to be covering uh, 5G versus 4G LTE. Uh, I promise 5G is not spreading coronavirus through the uh, new towers. Uh, for some reason, that's been spreading online. So uh, depending on our new source, just want to get that straight first off. But um, before we really get into our topic at hand, just some general housekeeping. Uh, if you have a question, please feel free to type it in that question box. Uh, I will be monitoring it throughout this presentation. And uh, if you have a question, feel free to put it there. Uh, if I think it's relevant to what we're covering uh, in the moment, I'll probably answer. Uh, if not, I'll go ahead and answer it at the end of our webinar. So uh, please feel free to type a question as you see fit. Also, don't hesitate to reach out to me directly if you don't feel like asking a question during the presentation. Uh, my email address is tlevine at crnstone.com, and uh, I'll be showing the slide again at the end of the presentation, so uh, don't feel like you have to write it down now. Uh, you can also reach out to me directly over the phone at 513-487-5390. And uh, last but not least, don't forget to check out our resource center. Uh, it gives you quick access to all of our technology, client records, commission statements, and more, as well as our quoting tools. Uh, we've got a new document search system that I think is really nice. It makes it uh, very easy to find pretty much anything you're looking for. And uh, also, we have our 2019 and 2020 webinar recordings under here as well, uh, plus all of our white papers and customizable printer uh, printable materials. So uh, don't hesitate to check it out. So. Uh, without further ado, let's get uh, down to brass tacks. Uh, cell networks versus Wi-Fi. Uh, that's something you're going to really want to know before we get into the differences between 4G and 5G. Uh, if you don't know anything about cell networks, uh, you're, you're just going to be lost. So uh, first, uh, both cell networks and Wi-Fi use radio waves to connect devices to the internet. Um, We've covered this a little bit before when we uh, covered how the internet works and how to set up your Wi-Fi, uh, but a little bit of review. Uh, Wi-Fi uses radio signals to get your device to talk to the wireless router. Uh, cellular networks take that kind of the next level. Uh, the cell networks in general use radio waves to have your phone uh, talk to uh, towers, uh, whereas in Wi-Fi, it's just talking to one device. Uh, cell networks just carry that on uh, through their entire network. Um, mobile internet and Wi-Fi operate differently because of that, and uh, they have different limiters. Uh, with Wi-Fi, your general limit on uh, your communication is just going to be the speed over that network. Uh, but with cell networks, it's going to be bandwidth. Uh, bandwidth being the amount of information that's being able to be transmitted over a given path at once. Uh, sort of translated out of tech jargon, what that means is uh, the bandwidth itself is just sort of how much information uh, the network can carry at once over any given jump. So uh, the amount of information that's able to be transmitted between one tower and another. Uh, towers are what the wireless data is uh, using to communicate uh, you over the uh, devices. It's kind of like a hub or a bridge if you uh, were in any of our uh, wired internet sort of uh, videos. Uh, that's basically the device that's kind of regulating the communication over the network. So uh, think of it as a giant game of telephone, uh, whereas a wired network is going to be limited more at how quickly it can uh, relay that message uh, over one person to another. Uh, the wireless network is going to be limited in the amount of, you know, conversation it can carry. So where a uh, wired network would happily transmit an entire conversation very easily, a uh, wireless network is only going to be able to say maybe one or two sentences with the same amount of uh, time. So uh, it's really just a limit of how much information can be transmitted at once. Also, uh, just so you know, information is transmitted in bits. Uh, the bits per radio wave are fixed, and uh, radio waves are what they're using to transmit that communication. Uh, the wavelengths carriers can use are also referred to as bandwidth, and uh, another main limit to it is atmospheric interference and signal strength. Um, where in a wired network, you're able to sort of transmit as much data as you want without fear of data loss. 
uh, a wireless network is going to have atmospheric interference, like messing with the data that's being transmitted. So uh, where in a wired network, you can just send the message once and you'll have no fear of the message being distorted. Uh, with a wireless network, you're going to hear static, you're going to hear interference, and that messes with the integrity of the data being transmitted. Uh, there are two ways generally around this. Uh, that's to transmit the data uh, multiple times over a bunch of different wavelengths, uh, and the other is to send the message multiple times over the, sa the same wavelength. Either way, it's taking more to communicate wirelessly than it is wired. So uh, let's compare data transfer speed real quick as well. Uh, this is going to be the main difference between 4G and 5G, as well as between wired and wireless networks. So it's important to know how to do this. Uh, because of that, the next few slides are going to be math and science heavy. I promise I'm going to make it really simple, uh, but just so you know, if you're uh, not a fan of numbers, these next slides might not be your friend. Uh, but this is really important as well for comparing wired network speeds and uh, comparing what you're actually getting out of your wired network. So either way, it's important. Uh, you're going to need to understand the metric system, and you're going to need to know the difference between bits and bytes as well. Uh, so we're going to start with a little bit of metric review and then get into the math. Uh, but don't worry, I promise I'm going to make it as simple as I can. So let's start with the metric system. Uh, metric uses prefixes to increase the factors of measurements by units of 10. Uh, for instance, if you see in the chart to the right, uh, it starts at a base of zero. Uh, that's just your meter, your uh, your byte, your bits, uh, whatever unit you're using as a, a base. Um, that's a unit of one. Uh, then, as your prefixes go up or down, uh, so does the scale of the measurement. Uh, this is increased by factors of 10, but realistically, people tend to increase it by three factors of 10. Uh, for instance, from one byte to one kilobyte, uh, that's a factor of 1,000, uh, or 10 to the third. Uh, megabytes is a factor of uh, 1 million, or 10 to the sixth. And then uh, giga would be 10 to the ninth. Uh, those are the three general prefixes being used right now. So it's important to just sort of know how to convert between them. Uh, all you really need to do is multiply by 10 to the power that uh, I have on the screen. But we're going to show you an example on the next slide. And please let me know if I'm going through this a little fast, by the way. Um, anyway, uh, so how many bytes are in a kilobyte? Uh, that's a question that I get a lot, and it's pretty simple to solve, actually. Uh, a byte is a factor of one, so it's a general base unit, and a kilobyte is uh, that base unit times 10 to the third. Uh, that can be broken down as one times uh, 10 times 10 times 10, which works out to 1,000. Uh, that's just generally how you would convert between those units. Uh, this also means that one byte is equivalent to one one thousandth of a kilobyte. Um, that being said, it gets a little more complex. Uh, one byte is roughly eight bits. Uh, bytes measure the amount of uh, data in a file, and bits measure transfer speed. So when you're uh, comparing the speeds of networks and you're trying to figure out how long it would take you to download a file, uh, you're going to have to convert between bytes and bits as well. Uh, it's a little different in the notation, and uh, networks like to trick you when you're uh, trying to compare these speeds as well. Uh, they do that because the notation for bytes is just a capital B, and the notation for bits is a lowercase b. Uh, typically, you'll see things noted as uh, for file sizes, maybe like 10 megabytes. Uh, that's the capital uh, M and capital B. And uh, the transfer speed would maybe be represented as 10 megabits per second, which is uh, capital M and then lowercase bps. Uh, that's typically how you'll see things noted as far as transfer speed goes. So uh, let's compare uh, 4G wireless speeds versus ISP speeds. Uh, ISP being Verizon, AT&T, whoever is providing your normal wired internet connection. Uh, you can measure this speed in megabits per second as well, but uh, typically they're going to use a different scale. Uh, they'll try to confuse you just because that's what 
tech companies like to do. Um, an ISP's connection speed has download speeds of at least 10 megabits per, or 100, I apologize, megabits, yeah, megabits per second, and an average download speed of a carrier's network uh, back in 2019 was uh, 32.375 megabits per second, which is only a third of an ISP's speed. Uh, I haven't actually updated these numbers, and uh, we'll get into the specifics of why that is in a second. But uh, generally, that's because carriers are trying to invest more in their 5G networks versus their 4G, and 4G speeds have kind of capped out. Uh, Verizon, however, leads the pack at 4G transfer speeds at 53.3 megabits per second. So, uh, to kind of understand what that means as far as uh, speed of transfer, uh, let's do a little bit of math. Uh, you must use the same units in whatever equation you're, uh, you know, comparing, and that's just so that you have consistent measurements across your equation. Uh, the formula that we're using is um, the amount of data over the amount of time it takes to transfer, and we're going to need to compare those in the same units. So for an example, let's compare a 60 megabyte uh, file uh, being downloaded over Verizon 4G versus an ISP. Uh, because you have to use the same units in your equation, uh, the first part of that formula, which is 60 times 10 to the sixth uh, times eight, uh, is just converting uh, 60 megabytes into bits. Uh, that is 60 times 10 to the sixth times eight. Uh, which I believe translates to 48, uh, 480 million bits, sorry. Uh, then you divide that by the uh, speed of the network in uh, megabits per second, uh, which you also have to take into account, and uh, then you get your answer. Uh, for the Verizon network, it would take nine seconds on just 4G speed in order to download that 60 megabit file. Uh, an ISP at its slowest speed would actually only take 4.8 seconds. So uh, you can sort of see the general difference there between uh, mobile speeds versus wired speeds. It's also why uh, you see people like me trying to connect everything they can to a wired network because it's going to be faster. So now that we understand sort of how to even compare speeds, what do the G's mean? Uh, G's just stand for generation, and uh, the standards for the uh, different generation of uh, internet connections are defined by the 3GPP. Uh, the 3GPP is sort of a standard setting organization, and they're composed of seven different associations that sort of regulate communication uh, in Europe, Asia, Russia, and uh, all of the Americas. That's uh, Northern, North America, South America, all through. Um, they determine what rules define each generation of network, but mainly the rules concern the different speeds of the communication. Uh, to see the difference, we can compare the 3G speeds uh, that were you know, common back in the 2000s to the 4G standards, which were implemented back in 2008. Uh, the peak data speed of a 3G network was 200 kilobits per second. Remember that's, uh, bits being the base unit and kilo being 10 to the third. So that is roughly 200,000 bits per second, uh, which is enough to use some basic navigation apps, or at least back in the day, uh, like um, you know Google Maps uh, with a tiny bit of delay. Uh, it's important to note that that was exclusively using that navigation app. Uh, you couldn't multitask, you couldn't use a bunch of other apps at the same time, uh, and mostly, that was just, you know, the standard of how to get internet, you know, to work over a mobile platform. Uh, in 2008, they uh, changed it and they decided to make the standard 4G. Uh, they decided to set the new standard for a 4G speed to at least 100 megabits per second, which is another increase in a factor of uh, 1,000. So uh, that's a 800 kilobits per second difference. Uh, so they basically said, okay, well, instead of communicating at a rate of 200,000 bits per second, they're gonna have to communicate at a rate of 1 million bits per second, which kind of changes the standard a little bit. Uh, it makes you able to uh, stream video and music without buffering, 
well also using those navigation apps. Although I will also say that was back in the day. That's not using uh, YouTube's current algorithms and encoding. And that's not streaming in 4K. That's just streaming in, you know, general basic sort of definition. So no high definition uh, stuff there. It also took carriers until about 2018 to hit 4G speeds, really. Um, they had something called a 4G LTE network in the meantime, uh, which is just sort of carrier for, um, it's not full 4G speeds, but it's too fast to be called a 3G network. Um, this actually tricked a lot of people into thinking they were getting full 4G speed when really they weren't. And uh, that's something that the carriers are uh, really, really good at doing. So uh, be careful about what type of network you're using. If someone says you're getting 4G speed and you see you're only using a uh, 4G LTE network, that's kind of a big deal. And you'll, you'll know you're not really getting the full amount of speed that you're paying for. So that being said, what are the standards for 5G? Uh, I will also say that last year uh, when I did this presentation, the numbers were a bit different from what I'm gonna show you now. Uh, that's because of the source I was using. Uh, the source I was using was actually wrong. Uh, I believed at the time that the standard was trying to get to one full gigabit speed. Uh, that is incorrect. Uh, that is the peak speed. Uh, that's not the average speed. Uh, the average speed of a 5G network is set to be between 100 and 400 megabits per second as an average speed of communication. The peak speed is going to be uh, to try to get up to 1.8 gigabits per second. And it's important to note that's another increase in scale. Uh, remember, first we started in kilobits, then we went to megabits. Now we're talking gigabit speeds. Uh, comparing that uh, roughly, you know, one megabit is only 100,000 bits, uh, one gigabit is roughly 1 billion bits. So that's a huge amount of data speed increase. Um, the difference in speed is actually achieved through low latency standards. And latency is roughly defined by how fast you can respond to information you receive. Um, the real uh, translation of this into non-tech terms is it's the amount of time that communication is taking between one tower and another over a network. The goal is to reduce the amount of time that uh, those towers spend talking to each other. And uh, the result of that is increased data transfer speeds. Uh, the goal of 5G is really just to reduce latency to the level of a wired network or a uh, home ISP network. And there are a lot of different ways you can uh, achieve this, but generally the consensus is that this will be achieved through using higher uh, frequency waves. Um, the additional standards, uh, other than just the data speed transfer uh, for a 5G network, include no worries of device crashes while you're using the internet. Um, additionally, uh, there is uh, a standard that you're going to be able to stream in 4K over uh, mobile network as well using 5G uh, without much buffering. Uh, also, uh, the goal is to make this network separate from the 4G or 3G infrastructure, although this is mostly just due to a technical issue. Um, and also, it's going to have to be capable of handling driverless cars and uh, connecting a bunch of different home products together. Um, I think that's going to be very difficult to implement just because of the technical issues with it, uh, but we're going to get into that in uh, two slides. So realistically, before we get into that, how does 5G measure up? Uh, let's use that 60 megabit uh, transfer again. And uh, just to remind you, over a uh, ISP network, um, the transfer speed is going to be 4.8 seconds for a 60 megabit file using our full-fledged uh, 4G network, uh, that's going to take roughly nine seconds. But using 5G, uh, you can see that the standard uh, speed is actually faster than a landline connection, which is just kind of crazy to me. Um, using just an average 5G speed, uh, you're going to be able to completely transfer a 60 megabit file in 0.96 seconds. That's under a second, which is just crazy for wireless transfer speed. Uh, and using a peak speed of 1.8 gigabit per second, I just did the math for fun, uh, you're going to get to uh, 0.268 seconds, which is roughly the amount of time it takes you to blink. Uh, so 
that's that's just insane you know uh, that's why people are so excited about 5g uh, because the amount of speed that you're going to get out of it is literally quicker than the internet speed that you are going to tend to get at home uh, although i will also say that's using standard rates uh, nowadays, you can also get uh, fiber or uh, gigabit connections, which would kind of put you over 5G in terms of speed. Uh, if you have a gigabit landline connection, then you're, you know, in the top tier of uh, internet speed, and uh, that's that's wonderful as well. Um, so 5G, really great. Uh, it's going to be faster than most landline connections, but if you're shelling out a lot for your internet, uh, the landline connection is still going to be faster. So let's talk about the actual technical differences between uh, 4G and 5G. Uh, first off, it operates in a higher frequency of radio waves than is normally used. And the reason for this is because the higher the frequency, the easier it can cut through air um, without like kind of having the air interfere with the amount of data that's being transferred or the actual integrity of the data that's being transferred. So, uh, you know, the more uh, waves per second, uh, the less likely that data is to be interfered with. Um, new infrastructure is actually needed to uh, operate in these frequencies. And that's because, you know, uh, the devices are only capable on the towers right now of handling up to, you know, maybe about six millimeter wavelength. Uh, the goal of 5G is to get down even further to maybe, you know, three millimeters or four millimeters. So uh, the actual hardware on these towers is not capable, like they aren't capable of handling that speed. Uh, that's why you have people going out nowadays and uh, erecting new towers or changing out the hardware on the towers. Uh, so don't worry, they're not spreading coronavirus, like I said. They're just trying to uh, get the towers in working order to handle the new frequencies. Uh, one downside, however, to using higher frequency is that it takes more energy to, you know, broadcast in those wavelengths over range. Um, that's because the waves themselves travel less distance. And uh, if you up the energy level high enough, you kind of lose the whole benefit of using those lower uh, lower wavelength uh, waves. So um, because of that, uh, you're going to see a few other issues as well. Uh, typically, without a signal booster, 5G will not work inside of cars, buildings, and railways. Uh, that's just something that comes natively with using these higher wavelengths. And uh, unfortunately, last year I was hoping that they were going to try and find a solution to this problem, and uh, they really still haven't. Uh, often you're going to see your 5G drop off when you go inside, and uh, you're going to see it you know, pick up again when you go outside. Um, so that's something else to consider. There are a few main barriers also to the implementation of 5G. Uh, last year, it wasn't fully figured out. Uh, security needed to be addressed. Infrastructure uh, needed to be put in place to handle this system. But also, um, it was only going to be available in major cities. And 5G itself wasn't going to be backward compatible. Um, as you can see, I've crossed out two of those issues. Uh, it is more or less figured out now. Uh, the technology has been pretty well tested. Uh, and also, uh, 5G devices are definitely going to be backward compatible. Uh, a lot of the 5G phones coming out have uh, technology implemented in them to operate in 5G and 4G. Uh, I'm not sure if that's going to be true moving forward fully, but a lot of carriers seem to uh, want to be able to provide the 4G and 3G speeds where their 5G isn't available. So you're likely going to see that. So uh, what sh when should you get 5G? Uh, that's kind of the main takeaway of what this is going to be. Uh, 4G is going to be rolled out in uh, 08, and or sorry, 4G was rolled out in 08, and it took carriers 10 years to implement fully. Uh, it's likely that this is going to be kind of the same sort of time scale. Uh, I wouldn't really expect to see 5G rolled out in uh, any sort of area other than large cities until 2025. Uh, because of that, uh, 5G is going to also be really expensive, and uh, most people honestly should wait until 2023 or 2024 before switching to a 5G phone as a result of all these. Also, the promise of 5G is really high, um, but it's 
it's really not been what's been promised. Uh, a lot of carriers are sort of going to a 5G LTE, which is the same thing they did with 4G. And uh, the speeds of that didn't really live up to the full 4G promise, like I said, until two years ago. So it's just something to be cautious about. But being frank, are you really most people? Uh, are you really looking, you know, to replace a phone right now? And do you replace your phone every five to six years? Uh, if that's the kind of time scale uh, that you're uh, talking about, then, um, you know, honestly, now might be the time to switch just because all of the carriers are kind of adapting to this 5G technology. And if you buy a phone that's capable of using 5G right now, uh, then you're going to be set in five to six years. You know, you're going to be able to take full advantage of that 5G network. Um, also, it'll depend on who your carrier is and what plan your carrier is uh, moving forward with in order to support those 5G speeds. Um, we do actually have a question uh, from Harriet, and it asks, uh, if you understand correctly, it only applies to phones, kind of. Um, Phones are really what would be uh, well set to take advantage of 5G speeds. Uh, 5G refers to carrier internet connection. So uh, the only other device that's going to use that sort of connection uh, is going to be a hotspot or uh, some sort of mobile internet device. So uh, exclusively, we are talking about mobile networks, which is your phone, hotspots, or anything else that uses a, a carrier's network to connect to the internet. We're not talking about landline speeds, just to be specific. Anyway, uh, T-Mobile. Uh, T-Mobile has been kind of hailed as the best adopter to 5G by area. Uh, as you can see by the area map here, uh, the light uh, pink area is 5G speeds, and the dark green, or I'm sorry, uh, dark pink area is 4G speeds. Uh, it's also worth noting that anywhere that you see 5G highlighted on the map uh, is also going to have 4G speed. So uh, T-Mobile has a very, very wide area of coverage. Um, the one thing that you're going to need to take into account with this is that the speeds that they're heralding as 5G aren't really living up to the full 5G standards as well, but uh, we'll get into that. Um, it also uh, has, you know, very low adopter requirements. You only need a compatible phone that's, uh, you know, able to use a 5G network, um, and uh, they're not actually charging an additional service fee to access it. Um, Sprint customers also using a Galaxy S20 or uh, S20 Plus uh, device can use this network as well with an update. Uh, T-Mobile and Sprint customers are kind of uh, trying to consolidate some of their network, so uh, you're able to take advantage of these speeds if you're on Sprint as well. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the drawback is it's not using full 5G infrastructure. Um, a lot of carriers are kind of rolling out sub-6 millimeter networks. Uh, what that means is the uh, communication over their network uh, is only using, you know, just the very, very tip of the uh, 5G spectrum, which means you're not going to see the full speeds promised by 5G. Uh, it's really more of an advanced 4G network. So instead of maybe, you know, living up to the full expectation of 400 megabits per second, you might only get about 200 megabits per second. So it's not a full 5G speed. It's definitely faster than 4G, but you're, you're not going to see the full requirements implemented on T-Mobile. Verizon, however, took a slightly different approach. Uh, Verizon is going to try to implement its 5G as a full 5G standard, uh, so it's not going to be LTE. Uh, there is an additional cost for it, uh, normally about $10 per month, uh, depending on your area but they're also not implementing any data caps of their 5G network. And uh, there's also no streaming resolution limit. Uh, this is kind of for their benefit though. Uh, they really just want to test their 5G network and uh, it's not really going to be available in a lot of areas. So uh, because it's only going to be available to a few people uh, who are willing to pay the extra money, uh, they're not going to have to compete with bandwidth and uh, there's not going to be any data cap. Uh, also, the areas with access, because they're extremely limited, are also going to sort of uh, narrow the amount of people who have access to that on Verizon. Uh, there is a full five-year plan to roll out this infrastructure, um, but 
like I said, because it's not going to be available in a lot of different areas right now, it it's going to take longer than that to really see full implementation in the uh, likes of the uh, T-Mobile 5G network. Um, because we're uh, located in Cincinnati, I have given the uh, Cincinnati map for coverage as well. Uh, in areas like Price Hill, the West End, over the Rhine, downtown, uh, Mount Auburn, Walnut Hills, Mount Adams, Evanston, Dayton, uh, Bellevue, and uh, a few other areas of Kentucky, you're going to see 5G wideband in parts of those areas. Um, so you'll see it sporadically. Um, part of that is because it's only going to be available outside because there haven't really been maybe many signal boosters placed. Uh, and also because of the, uh, you know, limited, uh, you know, range of the 5G network. You're also only going to see the uh, speeds guaranteed need a near a few landmarks. Uh, you can see those indicated by the uh, red hotspots as well on that map. Then there's AT&T. Uh, AT&T has sort of decided to go with a hybrid of uh, Verizon and T-Mobile's approach. And actually, they're the last carrier that I'm covering because they're the last carrier that has uh, really made a full uh, effort, I guess, to adopt 5G standards right now. Uh, they're kind of using a hybrid approach, uh, like I said, um, because they are building 5G, like full 5G towers, uh, but mostly you're only going to see those uh, sub six areas of uh, coverage implemented. Um, it shares its connection to Spectrum as well in order to help boost up speed. So uh, while your phone might only be uh, communicating uh, in the Verizon network through those uh, mobile towers, through AT&T, your uh, communication is going to go from your phone to a mobile tower and then maybe, you know, directly to Spectrum uh, because of the uh, shared connection there. Uh, Spectrum will then be able to uh, use their full uh, wired network speeds to speed up the uh, transfer. And uh, that's how they're cry or, uh, trying to reduce the amount of uh, latency over their network. And it seems like a great idea to me. Uh, we'll kind of see how this implementation goes moving forward. But um, AT&T is a carrier that I'd highly recommend switching to 5G on if you are looking to update your device. But if you update your device, you know, maybe every two or three years, you're probably going to want to wait until the next time you switch to update. Uh, anyway, uh, here are all my sources that I've used for this. Um, Really, 5G is a wonderful promise, and uh, the main takeaway in my mind is that it's going to be a really good increase in speed, but it's not fully implemented. And maybe I'd wait two or three years if you switch your phones frequently, uh, but if you switch rather infrequently, you might want to invest in a 5G phone now. Anyway, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my phone number is 513-487. 5390, and my email address is tlevine at crnstone.com. Uh, if you have any other questions about 5G or any sort of uh, upcoming uh, thing with regard to tech, please feel free to let me know. Uh, our next uh, Tech Tuesday actually is going to be an FAQ. So if you have any questions related tech te to uh, technology, please feel free to email me directly. It's uh, tlevine at crnstone.com, and uh, I hope you uh, understand a little bit more about 5G. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to let me know. Thank you.